Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your host, Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. On this edition of the show, I'm speaking with Ken Brock of Brock Blades. Ken is a former law enforcement officer who turned his love of knife making into an encore career. His knives fall squarely in the elevated custom self-defense fixie category, with many of his designs taking their cues from far-flung cultures and historical periods. I was introduced to Ken by Joe Watson and assured that his work would be right up my alley. Well, he was correct, and we'll get to talk to Ken and find out all about Brock Blades. But first, be sure to like, comment, subscribe, hit the notification bell, and Join us in, on Patreon and see what we have to offer there. Quickest way to do that is to go over to thenifejunkie.com slash Patreon. Again, that's thenifejunkie.com slash Patreon. The Shockwave Tactical Torch is your ultimate self-defense companion, featuring a powerful LED bulb that lasts 100,000 hours, a super sharp crenulated bezel, and a built-in stun gun delivering 4.5 million volts. Don't settle for ordinary. Choose the Shockwave Tactical Torch. TheKnifeJunkie.com slash Shockwave. Ken, welcome to the Knife Junkie podcast, sir. Glad to be here. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, Joe Watson uh, connected us. I'm a big fan of his work. And when I saw your work, uh, I knew why he sent you my way. Because I love small uh, EDC fixed blades, especially ones uh, like yours that are kind of bent towards self-defense and that kind of thing so it's a it's a real pleasure to meet you i think i saw your work at blade show is that right yeah i was there uh over along the back wall on the or the left side of the the building not far from where joe was okay all right so i'm pretty sure and i'm pretty sure i we met in person but uh we, we'll meet in person again next year yeah, uh, blade show is sure. always crazy it is it is, but okay. So I, I mean, I said in my introduction, elevated custom fixed blade knives, um, and and for me, I, I add self defense in there because uh, a lot of the uh, your designs seem to take cues from historical weapons, or like mm -hmm. I'm thinking of the skin do, uh, for instance, uh, and kind of translate it modern day tool weapon. Yeah, tell me about your influences. I'm influenced by a lot of the the old school. Uh, six blade guys like um, Al Pukowski and um, oh, man. Uh, Bud Neely. Uh, I really like a, a lot of what they did. So without getting into copying, um, I just took their ideas. So like the the Pukowski fighter that um, somebody was making a production version for a while. CRKT. I really like that blade. So I yeah, there you go. So I tried to do. I tried to maximize the amount of cutting that I could get on the blade <clears throat> for the, the purposes it was meant for. Um, but I also liked the, uh, the the way that Bud Neely did a lot of his small fixed blades. I didn't really like the handles that much. They seemed too slick. So like on a lot of my designs, I'll have a built-in guard because I want to keep it small. So instead of adding a guard, it's going to add more space and, and take up more room. I try to build like an integral guard with the, the finger groove. Uh, okay, Ken, uh, you're you're kind of uh, breaking up over the transmission here, but I was hearing what you were saying. And uh, Al Polkowski and Bud Neely are two of the first custom knife makers I was ever aware of. I met Al Polkowski at the custom knife show in new york city in like the mid late 90s something like that and uh i i was moved by the experience i didn't know much about anything then i just knew that i yeah. loved knives and Sorry. uh and his seemed to be something you could carry what what was it about his knives that uh really got you going just the they seem purpose-built they were um Everything you need, but nothing you didn't. You know, it's funny you say that because the uh, 
I already knew I liked his knives just from looking at them. And mm -hmm. I was very impressed by how most everything on his table had two edges. I was like, yeah. that is, uh, I, you know, uh, I didn't know I hadn't taken, uh, I've done a lot of Kali since I hadn't started it then, but I knew double edge was for me. I loved it. And then I saw some very, um, uh, plain looking guy, like a, like he looked like a regular suburban dad, kind of like how I am now walk up to the table and say, Mr. Polkowski, so nice to meet you. And he pulled out, you know, one of his large-ish, you know, five-inch fixed blade knives, I guess that's large on his, uh, uh, and, yeah. and showed it off and talked about it. And I was like, how cool, like, like, this is something like, you don't have to be, uh, in the, in the service to carry a, a fixed blade knife. Right. No, and I think, I mean, even now, I rarely carry a folder. I, I carried a fixed blade my entire career. I carried a fixed blade when I was a kid. I grew up on a farm. You always needed a knife. To me, fixed blades, as I like to joke with the guys that are friends of mine that make folders, uh, fixed blades aren't pre-broken. So uh, <laughs> they just make a whole lot more sense to me. Yeah, I like that. Uh, I like the term, you know, uh, pre-broken. That's uh, uh, so. All right, you were talking about your career. Let's let's talk about that for a second because I feel like it it uh, gives a lot of context for the kind of knives you design and the kind of purpose that uh, they're most intended for. Uh, and that is law enforcement. Right. You were a law enforcement officer for thirty years. Uh, thirty years. Uh, I retired was out for about six months and they asked me to come back part-time uh, they were running short on instructors so i still work a couple of days a month mainly at swat training well what what uh what were you doing or what are you doing what uh at sheriff's office or yes the sheriff's office we have about three little over 300 sworn people so it's a it's a mid-sized department and uh, so 30 years on on a department like that's got to be, um, you know, you see a lot and you experience a lot. I mean, how much would you say? Uh, I know that when you're a police officer or a sheriff's deputy, uh, your main weapon, obviously, is your sidearm, your pistol uh, or your shotgun or whatever, your rifle, um, certainly not your knife. But how did how did knives integrate into your carry then and and use use uh, case? So on my SWAT belt, I always had a fixed blade, one that would be strong enough that I could pry. Because a lot of times, with the information we would have on a situation, uh, whether it came from a CI or just bad information we wouldn't have the breaching tools we needed. So I realized very quick that I needed a, a strong fixed blade. And then most of my, the last 10 years I was uh, active, I was doing um, fugitive investigations. So we were in plain clothes and I always carried a, a fixed blade then too. It was just a smaller uh, fixed blade. Now, were these always things that you had made? No. I never carried a knife I made at work. And a lot of people would give me a hard time about it. I'm like, look, well, God forbid I get in a fight over my weapon and I have to stab somebody. I don't really want to explain I made the knife that I stabbed the guy with. <laughs> so yeah. I always carried one of my friend's uh, knives. He carried one of Joe's or a, a Mick Strider or um, a Joe Brom. Uh, several others that were in my rotation so yeah that's funny I, I i didn't think about that i know a lot of people don't carry their own knives because they sell them and they're like well, well that, you know yeah, that, that too but uh yeah the thought of uh well judge i i did make this knife and <laughs> yeah, yeah this actually, knife has your has your name engraved on it like uh <laughs> yeah well probably not a good look so uh you mentioned you did a lot of prying like that was kind of generally why you would have a fixed blade uh because it's a more robust tool um yeah out in the field but so you did a lot of prying what like car doors and uh serving usually papers? um usually screen door on on a, a house or a trailer 
for whatever reason, a lot of these uh, drug houses that we hit would not have a handle on the screen door. And the easiest way to do it would be just jam the fixed blade in there, twist it, and then you could actually breach the interior door. Man, well, I guess they're too busy making meth to think about security. Yeah. That's 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 crazy, man. I, so that you did a lot of that kind of like busting into places and uh, uh, breaking up drug houses. I mean, I know I, I must sound like a babe in the woods because I've never been in law enforcement. I've never broken down a door. But was this the kind of stuff you did kind of on a daily daily basis? Yeah, yeah. during that time, um, 2005, 2009, I was on a unit that was attached to narcotics. And we were basically there um, when they needed to breach and get into a house. They would call my unit and we would go do whatever they needed and then we would leave. So we did a lot of, we were doing two or three meth labs a day sometimes. God man alive well thanks uh thanks for taking care of that because uh yeah we we got more than we can handle but fugitive yeah. task force you said yeah yeah that was oh, the best job i ever that. had what was that so like? we uh i transferred from uh, that unit i was just talking about to um to the warrant unit at the time and i went to our captain and i'm like look this is stupid we're in uniforms and he's like, well, take a page from the, the, the marshals and go get some cars out of the narcotics impound lot. So we went and chose a couple of cars and we were wearing soft clothes and, and going out looking for people. And it's, it, I won't say it's a simple job, but in law enforcement, it's pretty simple because you don't have to worry about making a case. You just have to worry about finding the person you're looking for. So. You find the person, you hook them up, you drop them off to the jail, and then you roll on to the next one. And you don't even have to write a report necessarily unless something bad happens because the report that issued the warrant is already there. So you knock out a quick little supplemental and a lot less paperwork than going out making cases. Are, are people, in your experience, um, predictable? Yes. Of Yes, for the most part. That if you got somebody that's on the run, they're going to go to the people that they associate with. They're going to go to their family. They're going to go to their close friends. And they're going to go to places they've been before that may not be associated with a family member. So it doesn't mean you're going to find them quick. But if you stay on the, the people that they're going to have to have support from, then... It's just a matter of time. So during the time you're doing all this, um, all these these different roles in uh, law enforcement, um, is this when you started making knives? You were a hobbyist at this time? No, I um, law enforcement isn't a very high paid job. So to supplement what guys would do would be to go work a side job, like a security at a ball game or Hmm. Um, a nightclub or what have you. And I realized in the early 2000s, I don't want to live in uniform. I don't want to be a cop all the time. Hmm. And so I sold a couple of guns and a couple of custom knives I had, and I bought a grinder and, and some steel. And that's when I, I started attempting to make knives because it, it takes a little while to, to get in the hang of it. Okay. Well, for anyone... <clears throat> who has knives enough and guns enough to sell to buy a grinder, you obviously had a, a love or a thing for knives, uh, like everyone who is listening and watching this right now. So uh, how did that form? Where did that come from? Growing up on a farm and always, I was always a gadget guy. I like stuff that would help me get through my daily life more easily. So I was always big into uh, guns and knives. And then when I went to shop class in high school, there were certain things we had to do. We had to rebuild an engine. We had to build some stuff out of wood and then they would give us free time. So I found some steel and I made a couple of knives in, in high school shop and they were terrible. But uh, later on, I, 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 I was friends with a lot of knife makers um, because I'm a knife collector as well as a knife maker. So 
would call them up and like, hey, how do I do this? What what do I need to do in this step? What I'm cut and then a lot of it I just learned on my own by screwing up. Is you learn more by screwing up than you do by getting it right. So definitely learn an experience, but the internet forums were great because you always had people in there willing to to give information, which is something great about knife makers. They would um I rarely run into anybody that tried to keep a trade secret. They they were willing to share and even devote their time to to helping somebody else learn. You mentioned that you made a couple of knives in shop class, which to begin with is hilariously crazy uh, in this day and age. Uh, I, I we we're, we're of the same generation, you and I, I think, and I can remember that far back where that probably would have been permissible at my school. Um, but they also made you rebuild an engine. So they were actually yeah. teaching you something yeah. called self-reliance. Uh, that's pretty amazing. Uh, I ho hope that's on its way back. Um, but uh, those knives that you made in high school, did you take them all the way, heat treat them and all of that? Or were you making knife-like objects then? No, I, they, they were knife-like objects. They were, uh, I used the most, the, the worst piece of steel I could have used, it was a reciprocating saw blade. So it was super hard already. Oh. <laughs> um, and, and then I had to plastic dip the handle because you couldn't drill through the tang. So it was, uh, it, it was a pretty crappy first attempt, but the guy that got that first knife, he still uses it. Wow. That's pretty cool. Yeah, he's, a, he's a friend of my dad's. I talked to him not long ago and he said, yeah, I still use that knife to, to clean deer with. Wow, I'm surprised. I mean, that is amazing because people talk often about how, you know, uh, their knives will uh, or, you know, how their knives will go down and they will they will live throughout the generations. And of course, they will, especially when they're made with these modern materials and such. Uh, yeah. But to to be to see living proof of that, especially with a knife that you probably didn't think would ever nah. live that long. That's pretty nah. amazing. That was 35 years ago that I made the ones in, in shop. So then, okay. Uh, when you started to make knives in earnest, uh, this is, uh, I guess you were a sheriff's deputy. Yeah. Uh, you, you wanted a little side hustle, so to speak, uh, but sure. you didn't want to do security like, like, uh, might be the, the low hanging fruit in that job. And, uh, you sell some beloved guns and knives and you get a grinder. Uh, so you're starting, uh, you're, you're doing stock removal knives. Um, yes. tell me about that initial period. What, what is that like dipping your toes in something that serious? Well, I encountered the problem that a lot of knife makers experience. I tried to reinvent the wheel. I was trying to come up with a unique design and then Tom Mayo, um, who I knew before I started making knives, he said, look, Stop trying all that crazy stuff. You can take one of my patterns for all I care. Just make a simple drop point hunter type knife and grind a hundred of them out. Don't try to be crafty and reinvent and come up with a new design. Get your skills down first and then work on design, which was great advice. Yeah, it's like uh, the, uh, the analog to that in art which uh, I studied uh, many years ago is you got to learn how to paint realistically before you can get away with painting abstractly because sure. you can't abstract nothing. You know, you have to abstract yeah. something. Um, and uh, well, that's, that's the, the same. It's the, it's a parallel. Uh, you're talking crazy patterns. I love, I love what you're saying here because uh, I have books full of sketches and they used to be so crazy. Like, uh, you know, you could hold them one way and use them one way. And they were total, you know, fantasy knives and that kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, tell me about some of these crazy early patterns and what you were trying to achieve with them. To be different was what I was trying to achieve mm -hmm. to, so that it, if you looked at it, you would know, oh, this is something new. But I went about it completely the wrong way because like one of the first ones I did was a, a like a recurved like a hawk bill type blade with a tanto point. Oh, it makes no it. sense. It's, it's dumb as just, it's the dumbest thing it could have been. But 
that's what I thought I should try. And I tried to grind like five of those and I ended up throwing them against the wall. And I'm like, this is stupid. I'll just, let me just try to make a, a spear point. And, and then I'm like, oh, okay, well, this makes more sense. Uh, I can actually grind the bevels on this because it's simpler and I'm not that good at grinding yet. So yeah, it was some, it was some pretty stupid stuff at first. That's funny. Uh, well, you, you mentioned uh, a couple of people, Tom Mayo, legend, and yeah. Mick Strider, a legend. You're friends with these people, and and I guess we're, uh, as you were coming up, too. And Mick Strider, I guess he coined the term uh, murder grind. Is that what it was, murder grind? Uh, nightmare grind. Nightmare grind, yes. Yeah. Nightmare grind. I'm sorry. That's and It's because it's a nightmare to grind, but it wasn't. Yes any grind in particular was it? it was just like comp all sorts of compound it was just a compound grind and i i make fun of him i told him i said i know what happened you screwed up this grind and you just decided to, to call it something different and he just <laughs> smiled the, the, and even more of a nightmare for that is another friend of mine had got a, a fixed blade nightmare grind and he's like hey can you make me a sheath i'm like yeah man send it out here molding kydex into a nightmare grind mm. i won't do it again it's, it's like making a, a kydex sheet for a K-bar because that kydex locks into those fullers mm -hmm. and you have to spend so much time heating that up and trying to move it and it's, it's getting it so that it releases it. And right. Well, okay. T tell everyone what a nightmare grind is. So a nightmare grind would be, I don't have an example cause I don't do them, but if you took and you ground just like a couple of inches here, maybe a little higher than this normal grind. And so it's it's compound that the instead of how this grind line goes just in one motion, you're actually getting two dips. So you're getting a grind here and then another grind here. And seemingly it's useful. But it's also very cool looking, and I think yeah, that that's yeah. that's probably the the big draw. Um, we, I guess we, you could. We call those aesthetics in the business. Aesthetics, yes, yes. The aesthetics are are what it's all about. Though you could argue, well, the front is a it's a steeper grind, so you can handle tougher yeah. chores, and then back here is where you slice cardboard or whatever. But yeah. it looks cool. You know? It does look cool, especially um, when you get into. So like Mick does a lot of them with um, like a Damascus. So you really get to see the different layers of the steel when you have a nightmare grind. So it, it does look pretty stunning. Okay. Uh, you just teased us with the knife. Hold it up. Let's, let's, let's talk about this knife you just held up. This is a beauty. Okay. So uh, this to me looks like the ski and do what, what is this? Yeah, this is a scheme do. This is a larger version. So I make a couple different patterns. Um, if I can get them both on camera here. This is the original scheme do T. And then this is the TG. It's just a little bit wider for those that have slightly bigger hands. What uh, What does the T and the TG stand for? Uh, the T, you see, you're getting into trade secrets now. Uh, oh, okay. Uh, yeah. No, no, I'm kidding. Uh, the T, the scheme do T stood for traditional. It was okay. just, uh, uh, okay. Hold that I one up. A scheme do. Okay. Yeah. In so the blade, especially you can, yeah, yeah, yeah. This one does look more traditional in the blade, uh, profile to my, and then the, the TG is the same knife, but the G stands for grande. Nice. Just to differentiate it because it's a little bit bigger. So, is this? Tell me about your um, flagship. Like, t what are your models and what is your most? Um, what's your flagship? So, the Skin Do is it's the number one knife that I make. Um, years ago, I, I have a lot of Scott heritage, and I was looking around, and all the Skin Do's that I saw were. They were the tourist stuff that's made for yeah. um, made for that market. And I said, you know what? I'm going to make one that's functional and with the high quality steel and we'll see how it does. And it, it took off and people ordered that one more than any other. I don't have 
it's the only one I have. I don't have some of my other models like the um, the Double D. It's another popular, probably second to the scheme, dude. Here we go. Uh, Jim just brought up uh, the Ski and Do Model M. Is uh, I got to say that's my favorite with that swedge. That's yeah. a that is an absolute beauty. And you mentioned before uh, you were mentioning who is the oh Polkowski. That one to me has a just a hint of Polkowski in the yeah. blade shape. Uh, yeah. yeah, these. So uh, with the um, the with the Ski and Do, the thing to me that makes that knife so uh, like. I mean, it's it's obviously historical. It's always relevant. But right now, it's currently a very relevant knife because there are a lot of people who are starting to carry or or have been carrying fixed blade knives uh, who, are, who are longtime folder. I carry both, but uh, fixed blades are getting a lot more play. And, and people yeah. are much more interested in fixed blade knives and carrying them day to day than they have been in a long time, I would say, since you could wear it on your belt and... Uh, so what we're seeing a lot of are drop points, neutral things that you can grab and it's useful in either orientation if you're pulling right. it out in reverse grip and pretty much, you know, uh, in standard grip, a, an extremely useful drop point knife. And yeah. I, I think yours uh, is kind of, uh, that's what people are getting right now. Yeah, I agree. Uh <laughs> People are, you know, the thing about the knife industry is it goes from something's really hot for a while. So, you know, like for a while, everything was Pakal this and Pakal that. And mm -hmm. then you had uh, Tantos where, oh, if it wasn't a Tanto, nobody wanted it. And then then you had a period where dudes were wearing kimonos at the blade show and, and selling their Japanese um, handle wrap blades and... It just cycles back around. Yeah. And people are going to, they're going to find something and they're like, oh, we'll go. it's just like steel. I mean, we could go down the whole rabbit hole about all the different types of steel and how whatever the new hotness is, is what everybody wants. Yeah. But in this case, there's a big difference. <clears throat> and that big difference is A, drop point blades are ubiquitous. And B, the ski and do has been around forever. And and C, it's not a fad. It, it's yeah. just now, I think, um, catching on again. I think people feel permission somehow to carry blades. And I think a lot of that has to do with knife rights and organizations like that sure. and, and uh, you know, that kind of thing. But um, I have really noticed the and, – and have – I've always been kind of uh, lukewarm about – drop points in general i know it's a, a crazy position to take as a knife junkie or, or someone who just collects a lot of different knives but uh you know i've always kind of uh, had deference to to more exotic blade shapes uh, sure. but recently i'd say over the past couple of years since i've been carrying appendix especially uh fixed blade knife i've been i've been my eyes have been drawn more towards uh those kind of drop points yeah, they're just useful. They're 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 kind of a jack of all trades is in in the knife business. Okay, all right. So let's go back to you buy your grinder. Uh, okay. I want to I, I want to kind of track how you how you turn this into an encore career because uh, you don't want to do security like the other uh, law enforcement officers. You want to do this, but it takes a lot of time to get good at. So how does that yes. work with your very time consuming job? Well. <clears throat> I basically just on my days off, I would uh, spend as much time in the shop as I could. And I made a lot of crappy stuff that I sold uh, to guys at work just to uh, recover the material costs so I could buy more material to keep practicing. And then slowly I started to say, I realized I was getting somewhere when I could pick up one of the ones I threw against the wall because I was mad at it. and. I could pick up one of those blades I'd messed up and I could fix it. And I'm like, oh. now I'm starting to, I'm starting to understand why things happen the way they happen. I, how I can take this grind and I can fix it. Then I'm like, okay, well now, now I'm on track to not be quite so much of a, of a screw up. 
Well, okay. So was there anything in your past life, maybe in your past career, uh, where you had to master something and you finally did? Oh yeah. I mean, all the time. I'm I'm not naturally gifted at anything. <laughs> I've always I've always had to work at at whatever I had to try to do. Right. Okay. I guess my point in bringing that up is that I feel I feel this in myself, and I know that a lot of other people experience uh, resistance when you go to do something big and difficult. Like start, I'm going to start making knives. Like that's a big difficult thing, and there are a million reasons why you shouldn't do it. And you usually listen to one of those reasons. It only takes one. Uh, and, and, and the reason I ask you, yeah, everyone has to, at some point in their life, you know, if they're going to keep the same job for a while, they got to master that, uh, you know, if they're going to be a parent, they have to master their emotions, <laughs> you yeah. know, like there are, there are lots of things you have to sort of, uh, get in line. And then, and then when you really want to do something, something creative, like make knives, you throw up, oh, it's too expensive. I got to get the, all the right exact equipment. Did you get all the right exact equipment when you first started? No. I, the only thing I did that I made sure that I spent the money on to, to make sure that it was going to work the way I needed it to work was to get a variable speed grinder. I knew some other guys that had single speed and it's just not versatile enough. That you can do it, but you're going to struggle more. So I got a second hand drill press for my uncle. I got a um, basically just a chop saw. And then I bought my grinder and made sure that I got a, a variable speed. So when I'm hogging steel, I can run it wide open. But when I need to switch to like a 120 grit belt, slow it way down. And that way I got a little more control. So it's more forgiving that way when you can slow it down. and Yeah. Yeah, it's just way more precise. Doesn't heat your knife up so, oh, right. so much. And it's not that you're going to burn the temper out of your knife like a lot of people think, but your hands can only hold a, a metal that's at a certain degree. So you don't want to, you know, when you're profiling, okay, well, I can just let it run full speed. But when I'm finished grinding, I want it to be, I want to be able to make one pass without having to, to dip it and cool it off. So... Okay, let's fast forward to today. This is your. This is what you do. Uh, tell me about your shop and and let's get into your process a little bit. Okay, so I have a carport uh, that I had a, a concrete pad poured behind my house, and then I went and got one of these Carolina carports, had it installed, and then I framed it in with some help of some friends, and and so we enclosed it, and um, now I've added. I've added another grinder. I got a, a TW90 grinder from Travis Wirtz. That's, I mean, I know it's been 21 years since I started, but it's like driving a 75 Pinto and a, a 2024 Cadillac. I mean, it's just, it's way more precise. I can tilt it over on the side. The changes of the, uh, the tooling arms are a whole lot easier. And then I've got a, a blast cabinet, saw, small milling machine. Fordham grinder to replace the the um, the Dremel hmm. and uh, oh, yeah. a vibratory tumbler, and then I built I built an entire like an eight foot table for my Kydex presses, and I had to build several Kydex presses, but now I can make like five sheets at once. That uh, that really helps speed up the process. So that was part of what you were doing uh, as you were getting started, right? Uh, Kydex for other makers? Yeah. Yeah. So in 2004, I was contacted by the Hideaway Knife Company. And the lady wanted a knife that I'd put up for sale. And I'm like, look, I'll trade you one of mine for one of yours. So she said, okay. And she sent me two blanks. I'm like, what is this? I, I got to grind my own blade. And she's like, yeah, it'll be fun. Well, I didn't realize it was a uh, a job application. So I made the, the, I ground the blades, I made the sheaths for them, and she's like, send them to me and let me look at them. So I sent them to her, and she said, she calls me, and she's like, you want a job? Sure. So 
So I made between 2004 and 2005, I made, I made every Kydex sheath that Hideaway sold. Plus I was grinding blades for them too. So my own work kind of was pushed back a little bit because I usually had about 600 of those Hideaways in the shop at any one time. Well, but that's amazing. You were, you were getting paid and trained at the same time so that when you yeah. got to come back to your own work, it, uh, did you see a vast improvement when you got back to your stuff? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And I was able to kind of fine tune the way I was doing Codex as well. And that's when I realized because I started off with just a couple of boards with some foam and then I have to sit on them. And I'm like, this is dumb. <laughs> so I, I found a, a Codex press that would just kind of fold like a waffle maker and you could lock it down and then I could leave it and go do something else. So then that evolved and I was going to buy a couple more of those presses and they quit making them. So then I had to build my own. So I built like three more of those. And now, you know, one of my buddies hits me up and uh, Lewis George hit me last summer. And he's like, Hey, I need 200 sheets for this knife. I'm like, wow. okay, send me, send me five of them. And I turned them around in five days and were, was able to get them back to him. God. So I, I, as a hobbyist, I've made, I've made, you know, I'd say 30 Kydex sheaths for a couple of crappy knives I made myself. And then, uh, for some of the knives I, I have already, so I could carry them in my, and, and some of them have turned out, oh, spectacular. And some of them are utter crap. And I can't tell why one is one way and one is the other. Um, but also to me, this to me personally and i don't take offense but i think it's a horrible process i hated it and it, and yeah. like you I, I i i had to put weights on mine I, I did the stand on it for a while and i was like wait i got weights here and i put those on yeah. and but yeah i didn't like the process a lot of people don't so less he uh he doesn't like to fool with it at all so he just sends them to me because he knows i'll i'll take care of him and in return he does stuff for me all the time too so it's uh it's a mutually beneficial friendship for sure but it, it's one of those things where you you just kind of got to learn you got to figure out where your rivets are going to go for it to be the best retention and you got to figure out so like all of my blades will be um relieved on the front right so that makes it easier when you're inserting them. Oh, yes. And then my retention on these, well, if I use the right sheath, it would be. <laughs> you're talking about the handle the, scales have yeah. sort of a taper in so that they slip in. Yeah, because if they're squared off, then you're really going to have to flare this mouth of this sheath yes. a lot. And fight so, it to get it in. Like when I make a scheme do... I just wrap it, let it cool. And then when it comes out, I know my first eyelet needs to go here. If I'm going to make it to where I can thumb it off, then I heat this up and bend it out. But it doesn't take a whole lot just because I've done it so many times. Yeah. Uh, other ones you gotta, you gotta play with a little bit, especially if it's somebody else's blade, you gotta, you gotta kind of work it out. Uh, what kind of clips do you like? Well, I don't put any clips on my sheaths. But for your own carry, I'm just curious. For like, my own carry, because you I carry use, one. Yeah. I use um, either a piece of paracord or I use the, um, I don't have it in here, but just the little, uh, the nylon loops that snap. Oh, yeah. The IB because release. a lot of times I'll put two of those on a sheath and then I'll carry it small to the back horizontal. So, but most of mine are drilled for, um, for tech locks and, um, see, I'm blanking on the name, the DCC, D clip. DCC. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, I like those pretty well. I just don't offer them because I never know what people are going to want. Right. Yeah. No, no, no. I, I, I think it's a losing game to offer. Well, maybe I shouldn't say that, but, but there's some people who love the ult clips and that mechanical thing. And some people like myself love the DCC. There's the spring springiness of that steel, but the stoutness is incredible. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, so I love that. If people like their tech locks. You can't win. So I think I think that's 
when I, I do not expect a clip when I buy a, a sheath. I, I just need a good sheath. I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll worry about the clip myself. Uh, this might sound like a personal question, but you've mentioned Les George, Tom Mayo, Mick Strider, and a few others. Uh, how, did, how did you meet all these legends of the knife game? Uh, at Blade Show, most of them. Um, I used to go hang around and, and look at all the knives and just struck up conversation with all these guys and then became friends. Um, it's funny you mentioned Joe Watson earlier, and one of our mutual dealers had told me a couple years before I met him, he's like, hey, check this out. I'm like, oh, that's cool. Who made it? He's like, Joe Watson. I said, never heard of him. And so uh, I went to Blade Show the next year, and I go over to to that dealer's table, and Joe's standing there. And so I stood there for a few minutes, and well, some of my knives are on the table, too, and Joe looks down, and he's like, yeah, Brock, I, I need to meet him. And the dealer's wife looked at him and looked at me, and then Joe looks down and sees my name tag, and he's like, oh, crap. <laughs> so, and so we struck up a friendship because we're kind of in the same um, same kind of genre for yeah small conceivable fixed blades. And so then we ended up doing a lot of collaborations together. So um, this is actually... We did something pretty cool. We started it last year where Joe sent me some of his patterns and I sent him some of mine to do our own interpretation of the pattern. Uh, so this huh. is one of Joe's patterns that I put my own spin on. Wow. That's like a Quaken or something. Yeah. It, it looks like a traditional Japanese. That is so cool. So instead of doing like his Japanese wrap, I put my typical um, texture G10 on it and then the file work I normally do on the scheme dues. So it was a fun project. So you mentioned Bud Neely much earlier. That reminds me a little bit of a Bud Neely. I know he did. Yeah, I wanna, some... one of his, I don't remember what it was called, but I know what you're talking about. Yeah, yeah. Oh, man. Ah, so many knives, so little time, man. Uh, so what else do you have on the table in front of you, um, uh, knives of yours? Let's, uh, Mainly, let's see everything. Oh, this one's pretty cool. So um, Les George and I did a run of these. We only did a few, but that was one of our friends, um, Ram Maramba, Zero Knives. Oh, my God. Yeah. Ah, oh, rest in peace. Yeah. So, so Ram had been working with Les to to do a production run of that what he called a flywheel. And so Les and I were kicking around the idea of doing like a little neck knife, and he's like, "Hey, I found this pattern for uh, Ram's flywheel. What if we make some of those?" And I'm like, "Yeah, cool. Who do we talk to about it?" Because Ram wasn't married when he passed away. And so I reached out to another friend of mine who put us in touch with Ram's mother in the Philippines. So we called her and got permission to to make some of those. So we've uh, less ground half of them and I ground the other half of the batch that we did. So that was a neat little, neat little thing. Yeah, I, I remember uh, Zero Knives. Uh, he did a collaboration with... Boker, and I never got my hands on that, um, but I loved his stuff. It was, I guess it must have been in the, like, 10 years ago or, or longer when I was looking at his work, and then, and then sadly, he passed away, and uh, yeah. he was a, an ex he seemed like a serious talent. Yeah, he was, and he was a really cool guy. He, um, we'd chatted online. I never talked to him, and so I walk up to him at Blade Show the year he was there, and you know, he's a little short Asian guy with glasses, and I'm I'm already stereotyping what he's going to sound like when he starts talking. But he opens his mouth, and it's like this huge bass Texas <laughs> draw comes out. I'm like, what? <laughs> I, I, you're throwing me off a little bit, guy. So it, we always uh, we got along real well. He, it, we we made fun. I got a picture somewhere of somebody took a picture of us because we were debating who was taller. Because neither one of us are tall at all. So when somebody took the picture, I stood on my tiptoes and I, <laughs> I threw that in his face. I'm like, yeah, look, I'm taller than you. And he's like, no, I got photos, bud. You can't, you can't <laughs> deny it. 
So, Ken, how does it work with designs for you? Do you, uh, or your, you, let's call it your catalog. Um, do you have a catalog of designs and people reach out to you and you make them? Or do you do batches and do drops? And how many designs do you have active? There's a lot of questions here. Uh, but right. you know what I mean? Like, how does your catalog work? So a little bit of both. Um, I'll usually take when, when somebody has placed an order and let's say I'll have 20 orders and then I order steel to do twice that many. And so I'll make what I have for orders and then I'll throw in some extra, whatever I feel like making or what I think somebody's going to want. And then I'll profile them all out at once. Uh, grind the bevels all at once, drill the handles, send them to heat treat. And then when they come back, I finish the orders first, and then I'll gradually start making some of the others and I'll, I'll drop them on Instagram or I'll throw them on the website. Okay. Well, when you say orders, uh, does that mean, uh, books, so to speak, you have a, a book of People like do people reach out and say like for instance your rooster model and maybe Jim will will bring up uh yeah right on cue thank you Jim uh you have a model called the rooster which is a double edged up upswept call what I don't know what it what how exactly you would call it but it's a beautiful curved double edged hawk bill um, and if I wanted that and I reached out to you you would just kind of pull that pattern out and do it or do you or you have uh, I need kind of 10 of those and I'll, then I'll make 10 of them or like. No, I'll do it one at a time because I mean, a lot of guys will water jet cut all their stuff. Mm -hmm. I profile all mine myself, um, okay. which is slower and obviously it takes longer, but I don't want to have a hundred or something cut out and just sitting on the wall and it may not mm -hmm. move for a year or two. So I just do them as, as the orders come in. And I got a little list and I'm saying, oh, okay, Bob wanted this. And so I'll start making it. And then when it gets closer to, to being done, I'll hit you up and I'll say, hey, what color handles you want on it? Anything extra? And then I'll finish it out and let you know it's ready. All right. So uh, we'll talk about that later. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, but uh, in terms of the, uh, in terms of like what it was like in 2021 when you went full time, as a knife maker, what have you noticed in the three years? Cause you were making knives for a long time before that, but then you have three years of more concentrated activity. Yeah. So I, I'm terrible at marketing first of all, because I'm, I'm like a lot of guys, I just want to make a knife and, and make a customer happy. And I don't spend enough time probably on social media, throwing stuff out, making reels and that kind of thing. So initially, when I was working full time, I didn't want to get so behind that somebody would have to wait for a couple of years. Mm. So I just kind of was quiet. You know, there was a few people that knew and they would they would put in an order and I made them when I could. And then when I retired and started doing it full time, I'm like, I really got to fix up my shop to where it's more efficient for me to be able to move stuff around and move mm -hmm. this and there. And it's kind of like having two grinders and now I don't have to change the tooling as much. So I can leave one grinder to do this and the other one I can do this. And so it's definitely a lot faster now than it was then. I mean, I got more time to work on it, but I also get a lot of honeydews that I have to take care of around the house too. So um, it, it's a mixed bag. And then of course the economy now, is kind of depressed somewhat. I mean, let's face it, a custom knife is a luxury good, you know, yes, like a cigar yes. or, or something like that. So yeah. I've noticed over the past couple of years at Blade Show, the buying has been down. You know, guys that would normally come by and they might buy two or three. Well, now they're buying one. Mm -hmm. So that's been down a little bit, but I definitely have noticed that I'm more uh, efficient with managing my time because before I didn't have to be. Yeah, that's funny uh, you say that because I was just talking to someone like an hour ago, a, uh, uh, a you know a, a friend of mine. He's a custom knife maker as well, and he was mentioning how um, we were talking. I was talking about a different show that I'm not going to this year, and 
And just in general, he was saying, yeah, he has noticed uh, that at the various shows he goes to, including Blade Show, uh, that he's he can see a certain like monetary mark where people used to buy his 500 and above knives because he forges and he does Damascus and stuff. And that's what he was uh, known for. And now people are buying his below 500 uh, because right. it's kind of easier to afford. And, that, you know, it makes it makes sense. But. So that's one reason here. I started making these. Oh, sweet. So it's just a little scalpel. And essentially it's a cutoff from a bigger blade. And what I realized years ago at, at blade shows, you have some don't people. Oh, don't put it away? Yeah, yeah, leave it up. Go ahead. Uh, what I noticed was some people, some people will spend 50 bucks on a knife. Some people will spend... 250 some people spend 10,000 so i try to have a little bit of something for everybody so i started having these uh little cutoff pieces and i would grind them out send them off to heat treat and treat them just like a bigger knife and that way you got something for everybody hopefully that comes by i i love that and i'm looking around on my desk which is a mess oh here it is right here uh so this uh, is a little scalpel yeah. that I bought from a company called Fudo Forge. They make very expensive high-end kitchen knives, something yeah. I wasn't interested in and couldn't afford. But this was 30 bucks and it was or yeah. 50 bucks, something like that, sitting on the table. And I bought it. And it's actually, I love this little thing. Yeah, they're uh, handy. Yeah. And I, you know, I wrap mine with jute. Uh I, I'm looking at yours and I'm like, oh, I would love to wrap that thing with jute. I'd love to have that uh yeah. a little scalpel knife like that. They are handy and 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 I think that's smart. Like you gotta kind of um, you kind of have to meet the the audience halfway at at times. Um, yeah, there are times when you have to make your statement. Um, you know, you have your statement pieces, and you're not gonna like uh, budge on that. But you you also want people who 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 desire your work but can't get it to also have right. it. And sometimes that means collaborating with a company uh, who can produce it for you, or it means doing these little uh, cut off people love those things yeah, and and actually do. i would i would say that people who who don't carry fixed blades love the small fixed blades uh, yeah. as well so and another thing we started doing is i ended up with a, a supply of uh, mocha tai and mocha may and my okay. daughter is is very artsy with with jewelry so i let her use my shop machinery and she started making jewelry out of the the mocha may and mocha tie and so now we got something to catch a lady's eye because you know you yes. might not it's 95 percent guys at blade show but the ladies that that walk around you can see they're like oh there's not something only that for me but everyone like me who's who's on a weekend pass to go to to blade show i'm looking for stuff for my wife i'm like what am i gonna sure. get her here uh yeah. yeah that that is that's cool um and and yeah why isn't why isn't there more Mokutai and Mokume jewelry? It's such a beautiful material. You would imagine that's probably because lovely. it's 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 expensive. I mean, if you get a piece of you know, like a three inch by four inch piece of Mokume, it's three to four hundred bucks. So wow. you you have to yeah. you have to figure out how many pieces you can get out of that and and try to maximize your material. So maybe or maybe people just don't have time. I mean, I probably wouldn't have time to do it myself, but since my daughter's here, you know, she she helps out and she she runs the table at the show. So oh, cool. Uh, she she's way more um extroverted. Yeah. yeah, extroverted. Yeah, for yeah. sure. That that is interesting. Uh, I've talked about that a lot with uh with um guys on the show here uh just about the Blade Show experience and how it can be a difficult shift going from um all of the solitary time and activity in the shop making knives to going to, I mean, like the reverse of solitary. That's a sea of yes. people. And, uh, you know, uh, it, it is a, a little bit of a culture shock, I would imagine. Yeah. And it's different for me because I went from, I would go to blade show and I would hang out with my friends because right. for a long time I didn't have a table. So I'd go hang out with, with Mick and uh, Les and all my friends that I didn't get to see very often. And then when I started having a table, now I don't have time to hang out. 
mm-hmm. I've got to be at the table. So, yeah. I, you know, my, my wife will ask, she's like, Hey, well, what was popular at the show? I'm like, I have no idea. I stayed at the booth or the bathroom. That was, that was pretty much my extent of blade show. So if, if someone came up to your table and I mean, you, you might just tell them to pound sand, but if someone came up to your table and said, why, why should I buy a Brock blade? What, what would you say? Tell them they shouldn't if they're not sure about it. I mean, plenty of people make knives better than I do. And honestly, I've told many people, I'm like, look, if you're looking for this, go talk to Joe or go talk to Les. That's how they make their, that's how they make their money. I'm retired. This is a, yeah, it's a job, but it's, I get my retirement pay. I'm also still working at the department a little bit. If I don't sell a knife, I'm not going to start. It's nice to have the side money, but I would rather my friends be able to to get that instead of me. I mean, my knives are just fine. I'm, I'm not going to go out and tell you they're better than everybody else's. They're just different. I mean, I use good quality steel and, and my shoes are pretty decent. And I use G10 for my handles on 99% of them. You're not going to break it. If you break it, I'll fix it or I'll get you a new one. You know? But is it fundamentally better than anybody else's? No. Hmm. Well, that's interesting because really, I mean, that's that's kind of the assumption I go on with everything uh, in terms of knives, uh, in terms of custom knives. I'm like, uh, if your reputation is good, and other people have, you know, and I and I and I trust you, and your if I like the knife that's it i like the knife yeah uh and and i don't care if it's 154 cm or 440 c or magna cut if i like the knife i like the knife and oftentimes uh having uh knowing the person attached to it makes a huge difference and um but also getting into someone's style of knife um there's a there's someone i won't mention him whose knives i used to be like god what 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 is the appeal and man now i want one so badly it's amazing how i don't know you just sort of uh, can change your thinking getting yeah. uh, you know getting uh, seeing stuff through other people's eyes uh, you know yeah the, the, uh, there's truth to the statement that people buy the maker as much yeah. as the knife i mean they they like the person they like their attitude um their reputation and their knives are cool. Yeah, they're they're gonna buy a knife from you. They might. There's a maker that I won't name, who's been doing it longer than I've been alive. He makes fantastic knives, but he has a terrible attitude when you meet him in person. I mean, it's one of those things. So, do you buy a knife from him? I mean, it, it depends on how much you want it. Do you care about him, or do you care about the knife? Yeah, right. And I think there's a blend, right? There's there's a balance of I like this guy a lot. I feel like we we almost connect as friends, like we can hang out. And I think his knives are really cool. I'm gonna buy one of his over this guy that's a little bit of a jerk. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Sure. And then yeah, right. Um, I don't know. I, I, I'm good at separating the art from the artist, but you meet a jerk and then you're like, eh. Yeah, I'm not so I'm not so inclined now. Well, a, as we wrap here, let let me know, Ken. What are your like? What is the knife you want to make that you haven't made yet? This is a question I, I keep finding myself asking people because uh, I, mm. you know, you can kind of track where someone's going, but you know, you can never tell. One I haven't made yet. Oh, I've made a lot of crap. Some of it was crap. Some of it was okay. Um. think i would like to make just like a four inch outdoorsman's knife that doesn't look um super different than anything else on the market it's just a drop point comfortable can do anything kind of knife and i hadn't really sat down and tried it yet uh, but that's and I say I would like to make that because that's what I tend to carry most often is something in that size range when I'm out in the woods. So uh, that'd probably be the one that that I want to make. I just haven't got around to it. 
Well, fantastic. We'll be here for it. We'll watch. We'll we'll see what you come up with. Uh, but in the meantime, you got a lot of really cool stuff that you've uh, you. already made, patterns that you have that, that can be ordered. Uh, tell us how people can get in touch with you to order a knife or, or you know, bend your ear. Yeah, sure. You can hit me up on um, Brock underscore blades on Instagram or uh, brockblades.com. Either one of those will get you to me. You can send me an email, a direct message, what have you. Yeah, and and I definitely recommend checking them out because, I mean, going to Instagram and your website because you get a good variety of the different kind of blades you make. Ken, it's been a real pleasure talking with you, man. I really appreciate it. And, uh, well, thanks for joining me here on the show. Thanks for having me. I enjoyed it. It's my pleasure. Ever start looking for your next knife purchase before your last purchase has even arrived? Then you're probably a knife junkie. There he goes, ladies and gentlemen, Ken Brock of Brock Blades. Uh, do go check out his work. Uh, at, now that I mention it, uh, check out his website, too. A lot of people don't keep up with their websites. He's got a cool gallery that has a lot of different blades in it. And uh, uh, check out the one called The Rooster. Oof. Not only a good song, uh, but a super cool blade. All right, ladies and gentlemen, be sure to join us next Sunday for another great uh, knife conversation, uh, Wednesday for the Midweek Supplemental, and Thursday for Thursday Night Knives Live. All right, for Jim, working his magic behind the switcher, I'm Bob DeMarco saying until next time, don't take dull for an answer. Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, theknifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at theknifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on theknifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at theknifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to Bob at theknifejunkie.com or call our 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487, and you may hear Hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast. Mm-hmm.